Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Andrew. I'll just, um, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out on this cold uh, night to listen to my lecture. And I want to express a particular thanks to my family, Bill, daughters, Olivia and Sorsha, and my sisters who travel from Belfast to be here. Um, also, thanks to my very good friend and collaborator over many years, Les Todras and all of my long-standing colleagues who have travelled here tonight from the University of Hull, from London, from the Midlands, um, Birmingham City University, Bournemouth University and Melbourne. And I'd like to thank my new colleagues at the University of Brighton. I thank you very much for affording me this opportunity this evening. Some of the material I'm going to draw on is very emotionally charged and if it gets difficult, it's quite all right to leave, the, uh, to leave the room if you need to. But I'll begin. So imagine this. To see one loved so much change in this way? No. It is so natural to refuse that this is happening. Her memory can function as before. How deep is the urge to want to stop it? This deserves at least an angry no, a great refusal, a denial in any way that is possible. At times, it is also a sinking feeling. A nausea of awareness breaks through. His being sickened by your saying something over and over and over again. He needs to temper this. Her memory loss cannot be stopped. Anger towards self, her professional, but this is not enough. Helplessness dawns. Saying no to her memory loss heightens their struggle. She feels pressurized, upset. He feels remorse, such deep remorse that carries a dawning. That trying to deny that she is seeping away just does not work. What I've just shared with you is an example of an embodied interpretation that is part of a description from a phenomenological study of caring for a lifelong partner who is living with dementia. And that particular piece is a little tiny fraction from the part about the emotional learning of patients. My work involves wanting to really understand and communicate the significant experiences of others and believe that this kind of knowledge can lead care and can help services. Further, meaningful experiences such as this one can easily get lost in systems and technologies, adding to the terribleness of the experience of those we are caring for, but also obscuring directions that practitioners might be able to take in delivering humanly sensitive care. I hope that this beginning offers a kind of resonance that opens up a linking of the I to the thou, our common humanity. That is the red thread through my lecture tonight. I hope that what I offer you is a touchstone to my values and the ways in which I've been thinking about and trying to understand the world of caring. So this is our map for this evening. There are four phases in my lecture. First, I'll say a little bit about the foundation given by life world theory and where it comes from. In this part, I will introduce what I mean by the relevance of the existential and why we need to get back to the matters and back to existential issues. And here I'm standing on the shoulders of several key scholars from continental philosophy. Secondly, I will introduce well-being as a felt human experience that is always in relation to its absence, suffering. And we'll very briefly touch on the development of the dwelling mobility theory of well-being and suffering. I attempt to offer some examples of well-being as intertwined with suffering as one important illustration of crucial existential issues. And this is a showing of the life world perspective. Thirdly, I will point to the complexities of practice, how practical wisdom is central, and how philosophical ideas about the good, ethics, the true, knowledge, and the beautiful, aesthetics, are integrated in the kind of practical responsiveness that comes from being attuned to a foundation that sensitizes practitioners to the existential. Here, caring involves a certain kind of attunement that relies on sensitization of what people go through and a certain kind of openness to the other. 
I metaphorise Plato's The True, Good and Beautiful as head, hand and heart and make a case for how we know what to do in caring practices. And fourthly, I will conclude with how these ideas are one way to remember the essence of care, rightly taking back to the matters of human well-being, freedom, vulnerability and dignity, with the implications all of this has for the essence of health-related caring. On the way, the illustrations I share are an attempt to facilitate understanding of some of the dimensions of suffering and well-being that I hope will resonate. We are all human. And what I hope to achieve in an academic sense is to illustrate well-being and suffering in such a way as to demonstrate the knowledge foundation of the head, hand and heart of caring. In other words, thinking about the head, I attempt to offer a vocabulary and theory for positively understanding the existential issue of well-being and its absence. For the heart, a pointing to arts-based ways of engaging the empathic imagination in presenting well-being in its absence. And the hand, actionable implications that might arise out of this. The idea of caring often calls us to marginal or extreme situations, and we normally avoid these in everyday life. However, the illustrations I draw on are chosen in the, chosen in the spirit of caring that often calls for what is avoided or what is unattended to. I point to some matters through challenges of extreme situations that may be experienced as uncomfortable. These examples are shared so as to help me make a case for well-being and suffering illustrations as to demonstrate the deep complexity of knowledge for the head, hand and heart of care. Where knowledge is increasingly contested and our professional notions about evidence seem to evolve as narrower and narrower, sometimes by the necessities of science and technological development, and sometimes to do with the problems of our culture at large, it seems to me that there's no more urgent time to get back to the matters. Husserl, the founder of phenomenology, made this his great task. His project of phenomenology was to get back to people's everyday experiences and to understand human experience in the way that is seamlessly lived. Edmund Husserl, precisely 100 years ago, first employed the term the life world to set out his ideas about the physical sciences and the human sciences, the sciences of the human spirit. His attempts are set out in two key texts, and he uses the term, two terms, the surrounding world, in his book, Ideas Two, and in his later 1917 text, Crisis of the European Sciences, he refers to the spatial temporal world of things as we experience them in our pre-scientific life and life outside of science. This is a world that is not only about objects perceived through the senses, but rather objects that are valuable, objects that are beautiful, objects that are significant and meaningful, and objects that might be harmful. It is the world in all its richness as we experience it, and it corresponds with our everyday involvement and awareness of our involvement with the world. Just as the goldfish takes for granted the water in which it is swimming, we too, in everyday ways, take for granted all the relations we have in the world, in time, in space, in our body, with others, and in mood, and most often not thinking about them. An important and well-rehearsed point here is that we are not just physiological collections of things that require maintenance and fixing, but we live in the seamless flow of happenings that are immediate and sometimes unnoticed by us, for example, the experience of fresh air, natural light, quiet, sleep and rest, comfort, activity and movement, contentment, sense of place and continuity. And sometimes we are assailed by happenings, as in the experience of loss of dignity, anguish, humiliation, anger, the experience of artificial light, restlessness, thirst, sleeplessness, discomfort, being confined to bed, a world that is humanly lived. This is the life world. The seamless experiential happenings of the everyday that constitute how we are in ourselves 
our sense of our own well-being or its absence, our sense of our dignity or indignity, and our sense of our vulnerabilities. It is these matters that I want to draw attention to this evening. The matters concern, for example, otherness, limitations of human life, facticity, and how suffering, well-being, and dignity are real things experienced by people, not empty com concepts. Here I'm following Husserl, where he th thought considerable illumination about the nature of physical science could be achieved by attending to how it arises out of our everyday, non-theoretical dealings with the world. A focus on what things are, their whatness. He proposed a scientific discipline of slowing down, taking a step back from what we already know to attend to the things in themselves. What are these things in themselves? These are the issues that practitioners are up close to every day. And this is the everyday realm of care delivery. Falling ill, one day we are fine, the next we are ill. Growing old in one's body, living as this body, I am my body and I am changing. Having to leave the life that you had or having it wrenched away, never to be the same again. Care contexts where death is sometimes close or always present, such as intensive or critical care, for example. All the ways in which we humans are frail and vulnerable, but do not notice until something goes wrong, from a body or body parts that do not function as before, through to having to live facing one's demise on a daily basis. These are the issues that the existing qualitative health literature is replete with. And as participants in the human condition, we all know something of these. These are the matters that have drawn my interest towards what can possibly guide care in these situations that transcend or cut across all our diagnostic and specialist categories of the professional world. And these are the matters that emerge as super important within a now vast qualitative research literature base. We are afforded the possibility of a felt knowledge of what something might be like from the inside. But what kind of evidence for care do we need to apprehend and respond to the ruptures in the life world such as these? My key point is that an evidence foundation for care that begins in the life world needs to be complex enough to do justice to the meaningful understandings of human life with all its joys, dignity, its sorrows and its vulnerabilities. The matters such as these can be addressed by a growing body of qualitative research. Some examples from Swedish studies undertaken by my collaborators include a sense of being alienated through the experience of not being able to speak fluently following a stroke. A further study, women with heart failure described feeling abandoned. A professional focus stuck only to diagnosis and treatment, but their heart failure affected their whole life. They lived through existential uncertainty daily, and they just wanted an acknowledgement of the struggle, recognizing that professionals weren't able to do anything about it. Responding to human life also requires an evidence base that includes the evidential. I say this because to evidence the human condition must be to provide an account of the modes of existence. And when the life world is ruptured, new modes of existence are manifest. Qualitative research teaches us that these modes are important to attend to in care if care is to be caring. The evidential is also important because it includes the constant flux and movement of the world that appreciates both the uniqueness and banality of things and situations. To understand human life is to apprehend both its immensity and its ordinariness. And because these ideas are of relevance to all social science, to use some words from the anthropologist Nigel Report, human life is an inward personal adventure of each in the face of the other. That's from his 2017 text, Being Undisciplined, Doing Justice to the Immensity of Human Experience. Some of my work has been concerned with drawing knowledge from the arts and literature to provide language that is qualitative and resonant with human experience and that can do justice to this immensity. 
And further, we can draw help from philosophies of human qualitative experiencing, such as phenomenology and existentialism in this regard. Philosophical theories such as the work of Husserl, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, Levinas, Buber, de Beauvoir, Edith Stein and others can act as a navigation and ground to build a knowledge foundation that is deep enough to shed light on what constitutes the deepest experience of well-being and its absence, the deepest experience of suffering to guide what can be done in practice and this is what my most recent work has been trying to achieve. In answering the question why we need the existential in care, I focus on two key areas. Firstly, the need to develop a vocabulary of existential knowledge. We are still only in the beginning phases of articulating existential phenomena that can guide caring practice. Existential knowledge refers to the pre-disciplinary concerns of the meaning of living. The meaning of living through significant life conditions are important to understand when engaged in meaningful caring. Qualitative research has made an important contribution, but it needs to be deepened and systematized. We do not yet have a positive language for well-being or a holistic language for suffering. And in considering the depths and details of what people go through, holistic live phenomenon come into view such as vulnerability, sense of abandonment, and so on. And existential knowledge about them is more than just their psychology or sociology, something which Husserl articulated in the crisis of the European sciences. So we need an existential, more qualitative vocabulary. Secondly, the need for a kind of complex knowledge that is embodied, ethically sensitive, and sustained in, for caring. So although the content of knowledge is important, for example, understanding different kinds of dignity or different kinds of well-being, this is technical knowledge that could be metaphorized as the head. We also need knowledge of its aesthetic, its feel, which could be metaphorized as knowledge for the heart. And we need actionable potential, which can be metaphorized as the hand. So knowledge of the head, hand and heart of an existential phenomenon such as well-being, suffering or dignity require existential resources that are up to this task. Further, we can't just do care in an instrumental way. Care needs to be caring. I'm attempting to point to existential resources that are sufficiently deep enough to guide the head, the hand, and the heart of care, thereby addressing human existence. I argue that care can be sensitized by what people go through, and that such understandings can deepen understanding at a common humanity level. They can point in palpable ways to draw attention to what it is like, and this can give directions for practice. It can lead to empathic responses, and it is all this that can perhaps keep open a capacity for care. So now moving to the second phase of my lecture, I will now briefly illustrate an example of existential knowledge by focusing on the phenomenon of well-being and its absence, suffering. But I will try to appeal not only to the head, but to the heart as well by drawing on resources from the arts with the aim to facilitate empathic imagination of what it's like and which may appeal to our common humanity. I'm going to present well-being and suffering in a particular way that participates in what I argue for later, the need for a knowledge foundation of the head, hand and heart, or in Plato's words, truth, ethics and beauty, by drawing on the logic of a theory of well-being and then illustrate what that well-being might be like experientially. This has been a focus of co-authored work with Les Todras, where we develop a new theoretical framework to describe existential well-being for understanding the deepest possibilities of well-being and also its absence, the deepest possibilities of suffering. A key point is that there is always some freedom, even if limited, and some vulnerability in any condition, and always some possibility for moving forward as well as for settling in any condition. 
So through our collaboration between nursing and psychology, we point to 18 kinds of well-being that might be encouraged within practice, although there may be many more. And 18 kinds of suffering that can act as a sensitizing resource for humanly sensitive care. Our existential theory of well-being has three core emphases. On the one hand, mobility or a sense of possibility, and on the other, dwelling or a sense of settledness and peace. And a third, when dwelling and mobility are intertwined, which constitutes the deepest possibility of well-being. Well-being, with its emphasis on mobility, refers to a capacity for moving in ways that expand one's life ranging from metaphorical forms of movement and possibility, the feeling, sense, and imagery of movement, to literal movement. Mobility as a sense of movement describes all the ways that one can have access to the feeling of possibility. Metaphorically, we could describe it as a sense of adventure, a sense of moving into wider horizons, a new dawn being connected to our life's desires, and so on. The essence of mobility lies in all the ways that we are called to the existential possibilities of moving forward in time, in space, with others, in our mood and our bodies. And we could say that it's a kind of eros or energy that can give a feeling of flow or sense of aliveness and vibrant movement, a sense of adventure. And well-being with this emphasis on dwelling refers to a sense of being at home with what has been given. There is a sense of rootedness, of settling into what is there, a letting be and a certain kind of peaceful attunement. The essence of dwelling lies in all the ways that we existentially come home to what has been given in time, space, others, mood in our bodies. So well-being as dwelling is a capacity for settling and to feel at home with what is there and it might be experienced as a sense of peace. Now these variations are an emphasis rather than something in themselves, but they might be practically useful. In this work, we have further delineated kinds of dwelling and kinds of mobility using a phenomenological framework from established philosophical ideas about the basic structures of human experience, which are time, space, being with others, mood, and living as this body. This is an example of work that considers the import of existential knowledge for practice by going back to the matters and then developing directions for care. Now, I don't have time to illustrate all 18 dimensions of the theory of well-being, but for now, this evening, we could look at two. So on the top of this slide, you'll see the emphases of dwelling mobility and when they're intertwined. And on the left-hand side, down this left-hand side, you'll, the basic structures of the human experience is described by Husserl, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, and Medard Boss. And then the descriptive word or the description we give each well, kind of well-being to try and describe its deep, deepest sense. So we can imagine that in the spatial domain, when dwelling is emphasized, there may be a sense of feeling at home in well-being as a sense of feeling at home, the spatial possibilities of environment or place offer settling or stillness. So well-being as a sense of at home is anything that can offer a place of settling. Imagine dwelling with a spatial emphasis, a kind of sense of home. Findings from a study funded by the Cross Research Councils UK project on the meaning of mobility to older people living in isolated rural areas revealed how older people expressed a particular feeling at home in their locale that they valued more than mobility. This finding came as quite a surprise when all the literature assumes that older people in rural areas want more mobility, but it turned out to be much, much more complex than that. The research findings revealed that mobility could only be understood in relation to dwelling and willingness to reside there. And here's one example of the spatial emphasis of well-being as dwelling, offering a place of settling. A couple who know very well what's in a 30-mile radius of their home and whose gardens import to them. It's like being on your own world here, nothing we actually need. And we have the roses. 
So I hope that this example appeals not just to the logic of a dwelling emphasis in a spatial sense, but also the aesthetic sense of what at-homeness might be like. And you can imagine that well-being is never alone, it's always intertwined with its absence. In the embodiment domain, when mobility is emphasised, there may be a sense of vitality. Such vitality is characterised as a bodily energy that carries with it a quality of movement in ways that are wanted or valued. At an existential level, vitality can be characterised as a sense of movement in imagination, in desire, or in any feeling of extending one's life's possibilities. Vitality, in essence, is a sense of possibility, of horizons opening up. I hope that this appeals to the logic of mobility in an, in an embodied emphasis. Vitality is there when we feel good in our bodies in energised ways and when we feel ready to go. We can also imagine when dwelling and mobility are absent, there can be no vitality, no sense of being at home, spatially or in the body or with others. When a sense of mobility, either literal or imagined, or a sense of dwelling, literal or imagined, are both absent, there can be no vitality, no at-homeness, no present-centeredness, no kinship or belonging, no peacefulness, no comfort, no sense of I am myself, no sense of adventure. These are the deepest possibilities of suffering, but there may be many step-down variations that are not as extreme as these. We can name kinds of suffering when both a sense of dwelling and a sense of mobility are absent. These are not things in themselves, they are emphases, but they do open up the possibility of an existential description that can attend to the matters. We can imagine many kinds of suffering based on the basic qualitative dimensions that are inherent to any experience. Spatiality, living in space, living with others, mood, living as this body and identity. So you can imagine the logic of no possibility for dwelling in spatial ways, feeling exiled. No possibility for dwelling in temporal ways, the present eludes us. No mood dwelling, agitation and so on. And it is possible to imagine suffering with a mobility emphasis, in spatial ways, a sense of imprisonment, in temporal ways, a sense of a blocked future, in interpersonal ways, a sense of aversion, and in embodied ways, a sense of stasis and exhaustion, and so on. So far, I've attempted to illustrate suffering as the absence of dwelling and mobility and have offered existential vocabulary of its matters. These kinds of resources, existential qualitative descriptions, and resources to imagine this, place emphasis on aesthetic knowing, in other words, what it is like for the other, and can open the possibility of stepping into another's shoes, and might be able to be used alongside research findings to help keep attention on the matters in practice and maybe could resource empathic imagination. Now, I wish to take just a few moments teasing out the foundation for care a little bit more explicitly. And here I want to deepen what I mean by caring as an attunement. If care is to address human existence, then it needs the kind of knowledge that is not already separate from ethics and action. Rather, it integrates knowledge, ethics and action. It is a certain kind of attunement, not a technical top-down prescription, but rather a sensitizing foundation that can provide such attunement to what vulnerable people need nurses and allied health professionals to attend to. Here we can look back to Aristotle also and his notion of a way of being in which knowing, doing and valuing are fundamentally inseparable. The idea of phrenesis is a kind of knowledge that is already not separate from ethics and action. Knowledge as phrenesis, practical wisdom, is distinguished from knowledge for making things, techne, and it can address a plurality of values. 
This is about actionable knowledge and the kind of practical responsiveness of the hand and is already integrated with specialised technical knowledge or theory, the head, the true, aesthetic knowing that may be sensitised by imagine this, the beautiful, and can address the complexity of living situations, enabling ethical sensitivity when it is difficult to act with certainty. All this makes up a certain kind of integrated basis for getting the right fit in care that practitioners intuitively know something about. It's a certain kind of attunement. In other words, care is a human activity that needs not just technical knowledge, but also attuned judgment. Donald Polkinghorne, University of Berkeley, explains this very well in his book, Practice in the Human Sciences, the case for a judgment-based practice of care, when he offers a more holistic foundation for practice that draws on theory and evidence, but is a kind of sensitized expertise. He says, judgment-based practice draws on all our human sensitivities, including our emotions, and integrates background understandings, felt meanings of a situation, imaginative scenarios, prior experience, and perceptive awareness. Background understandings involve not a set of logically ordered rules about what to do and when to do it, but is a holistic web of understandings about how to go about and get things done in the world. While essential protocols don't always guide us as to what to do in complicated human situations, and we need more than just technological solutions to give humanly sensitive service. This judgment approach integrates the kinds of understandings that are required to walk in another's shoes, can be resourced by imaginative capacity, and can make use of the integration of technical expert evidence and personal understandings with imaginative capacity. Three kinds of knowledge are already integrated here. These three emphases, the head, hand, and heart, cannot be absolutely separated from each other, and they are already fluid and integrated in practice, as all practitioners know. All of this strikes at what is needed for the capacity to care. So, in summary, I've tried to illustrate well-being and suffering in such a way as to demonstrate a foundation for care, or in academic speak, an epistemology of the head, hand, and heart. I've offered a vocabulary and theory for positively understanding the existential issue of suffering, knowledge for the head, and illustrations of engaging the empathic imagination in presenting well-being and suffering. And now I'm going to end with the fourth and final phase of the lecture uh, with the implications that come out of this. Now, some might ask if humanizing care by attending to the existential is a luxury in the context of a curative journey that gets the person from a better A, from an A to a better B. And maybe in some perfunctory um, cases in practice, it's okay to meet people in the objective gaze, and sometimes that's what people want us to do. However, my answer is no, it's not a luxury, because if we do not attend to the matters, especially when there is a deep rupture of the life world, we add to human suffering, uh, uh, the human suffering to pe in, of people in our care, and we have plentiful literature of just that. Further, there's an important point about how we know what we know and why this existential knowledge base is needed. Science gets to its necessary work when it abstracts from the immediate and intuitive world that we live in, what I've referred to as the life world. In the interest of a necessary objectivity and precision, the life world is stripped of all values and context. Now, I want to be really clear that this does not mean I am disparaging science, nor is it an attempt to argue that anything goes, but rather I'm attempting to point to some problems that are pertinent in worlds that are teeming with all the vulnerabilities of human life. These worlds are where professionals in healthcare and in social care practice are close up to vulnerability. And we have a problem with evidence if we conceive of it in only very narrow ways. This is because of what this might mean for a knowledge foundation for practices that can be meaningfully termed caring practices. 
And if we don't attend to this matters, these matters, then we are at risk of dehumanising situations or of overly objectifying people, when what we need is to engage with a range of ways to expand the evidential and to critically draw upon a range of kinds of knowing that are, are in the everyday and which are relevant to everyday lives. For instance, Mary Midgley draws attention to ever more narrowly defined views of contemporary human life, where the end point can only be an illusion of self rather than concretely embodied real experience, a concrete self. She says, the myth to which I especially want to draw attention to now is the one that credits physical science with a rather odd central role in our lives. This myth pictures our world as a vast mass of physical objects that are being observed at great distance by an anonymous observer through a huge array of telescopes. It is not by chance that the uh, observer is himself anonymous and indeed invisible because he is not a proper object at all. Like the telescopes, he is simply part of the apparatus that is needed to observe and record this endless range of facts. The whole process of observing and recording is called science, and it is seen as constituting a central purpose of human life." End quote. Now, thankfully, humankind has successfully made use of science and technology to successfully master great threats. But something of our human selves is at great risk of becoming fragmented or obscured altogether if this is the only way we are to look at ourselves. At its, at its extreme, this is a problematic stripping out of our very selves and the metaphorical water in which we swim. If we strip out the essence of human life and we inframe it in more dry ways, then something fundamental gets covered over or may even be forgotten altogether. So rather than a luxury, my argument is that we need the existential, particularly in the caring arena, and this is vital, and it should be a primary concern in health and social care. Paying attention to what it is like and how people experience situations is a resource that keeps open a capacity for care, and it allows us to do justice to the immensity of human experience in our research and in our practice particularly when so many pressures threaten and can erode this essential focus. It may be a way to sustain a capacity for care in the face of inevitable instrumental forces. The implications open up a research agenda with work that's needed on one, firstly, existential issues such as loss, abandonment, alienation, and so on, alongside what this means for personalized care. While these are all present in the literature, they remain under-theorised. I'm working on a programme of work to theorise such issues, and the most recent example is the delineation of dignity as an experienced phenomenon. Secondly, we need methodologies to study these issues deeply, and such methodologies might come from phenomenology, from philosophy, qualitative research more generally, and also arts-based methods such as poetic inquiry. Poetic inquiry is just one way of a whole range of ways of understanding human experience through aesthetic presentations that invite participative understanding. And I've been working with colleagues in humanities and literary poetry to develop these ideas and to scope examples for practice. Thirdly, there could be a whole range of practice applications of a theoretical framework of well-being, dignity, suffering, and the humanization of care. And there are strong resonances and overlap with relational approaches to, re to rehabilitation in allied health professions. This includes demonstrator projects in development in practice with colleagues in the UK and Sweden to apply these ideas to enhancing care. And finally, facilitating caring capacity. I'm interested in ways that help students imagine what it is like and how this might sustain their motivation for caring, which brings me also to an educational agenda. And the need to help students to learn when to be able to take distance and when to come up close to existential issues in such a way that gets the right fit within a judgment-based care, but also helps them manage their emotional labor. And here is one offering that is one particular development of person-centered care 
labelled Life World Led Care. This is a humanising foundation, a more generic view that includes knowledge about our common humanity beyond specialised disciplines and is relevant to a range of professions. This is an agenda for care that is Life World Led and some of the parameters um, in this diagram characterise care as addressing human existence. It offers alternative descriptive power to the medical model and also social models, for example, of disability, whereby both may oversimplify the lived reality of people's worlds that are not fully able to attend to the fluidity of the world. So now to draw to a close and to conclude with what I've been attempting to point at this evening. Maurice Merleau-Ponty said that the true philosophy concerns in relearning to look at the world. Well, I've been on a relearning journey, and my love of phenomenology offers a way to step back and relook at what might have been overlooked within our gains and progress in disciplines relevant to human services. The aim of my body of work is to make a contribution to philosophically informed theoretical insights and their import for the practice of caring in particular. My overarching project is to bring things to nearness, and this includes describing people's experiences and representing them for the purposes of public and professional engagement, and it has drawn on contributions from health-related humanities. I believe that this may have many benefits for human services. In this presentation, my aim has been to show how phenomenology is one way to remember the very essence of care by taking a step back to the existential matters of well-being, suffering, freedom, vulnerability and dignity. I've tried to illustrate the intertwining of well-being and suffering in such a way as to demonstrate a foundation for the capacity to care. And it is my hope that I've shown that a framework derived from phenomenology can result in three things. Firstly, a reminder to get back to people living through the depths and details of experiences and the importance this has in leading directions for care. That is, the many ways in which human experience of well-being, suffering, are seamlessly connected to all aspects of individual's life. Secondly, the need for developing vocabulary and theories and research that focus on these matters. And thirdly, a complex form of knowledge that appeals to the head, hand and heart of practice and why this is particularly important if care is to be caring. This is a values-based agenda that feeds and nourishes a capacity to care. And it is also relevant for our culture at large. Deep respect for otherness, a sense of what life is like for others is an important sensitizing agent in all our culture and in any academic pursuit that has relevance for practice and in our world where human beings matter. Thank you very much. And may I now ask Professor Paula Kirsten, Head of School of Health Sciences, to close this event. Thank you. Thank you.